recording. Got to reduce this because I can't see where it is. Okay, from the beginning, the American Revolution Part Two. Professor Yolanda presiding. Here we go. America in 1775. So, the 13 colonies, the dark red. Um, the British held territories are the pink, and of course. Land was transferred from France over to Spain after the French Empire was defeated in 1763 in the Spanish America. Sorry, the Seven Years' War. Now, this is 1775, one year before the Declaration of Independence. This is all British territory in the light green. The dark, dark um, red. The dark red are the 13 colonies. Everyone is quite unhappy about how things are developing. And by the way, remember up here. The province of Quebec pretty much extends through the Midwest, etc. And this is what the Americans were bothered by, by that Quebec Act that I finished last class with, that said the British government, in order to minimize how many people were upset with them, because they were already had the American colonists upset, upset with them, they had a French, a bunch of French Canadian subjects who were Catholic in the province of Quebec, which stretch all through here at one time, and they recognize their right to their culture, their religion, their language, but to the American colonists who were quite anti-Catholic. They felt this was a compromise with a tyrannical religion, because in Catholicism you don't elect your own ministers, pastors, etc., whereas you can in many Protestant faiths. Okay? So, this is where we're at in 1775, and this is where things get interesting. Because remember, the Intolerable Acts have been passed. Boston is already being punished. And the reason why the Intolerable Acts have so much weight is because people in New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, South Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, Savannah, Georgia, more specifically right on the coast, Raleigh, North Carolina, Philadelphia, Delaware, all these folks are thinking, well, if the British Navy can shut down the port of Boston, if the British Army can occupy and rule the city of Boston and the colony of Massachusetts, then why can't they do that in Connecticut, and Virginia, and Delaware, and North and South Carolina? If Bostonians' political and economic rights are not safe, then why should we assume that ours are? We have the same beefs that the Bostonians have in terms of taxation without representation, and so on and so on and so on. So if this is the line that the British have crossed in Boston, there's no telling what they'll do next. So the Suffolk resolves take place in Massachusetts, where they simply come out as a body and say, we resist the intolerable acts. We do not accept their, their legitimacy whatsoever in 1774. Then, is that Boston, the Massachusetts colony, Boston, city of Boston. It, the convention took place in Boston. Oh, calm down. Eat a sandwich. All right. Now, <laughs> in September of 1774, the convention, a convention takes place in Boston where the Bostonians say, we as a body resist the intolerable acts and we call on all Americans to resist with us. As a consequence of this, the first Continental Congress meets in October of 74 in Philadelphia to consider broad American action against the British. Now, Congress is a verb to come together. This is why our legislature, our federal legislature, is called Congress. That's where it comes from. So the first Continental Congress was really just a simple term. The first meeting of everybody across the continent, the 13 colonies. And then eventually Congress came to be known as our legislature. Now, at this meeting, most of the colonies were represented. And just like the Stamp Act Congress, where an American identity was coming out, because now Americans had a common enemy, not just a common language, religion, and system of government, now they had a real common enemy and real common problems. There, you really get this sense that America is being born, if not legally yet, but certainly in the minds of the, of the uh, people at the Continental Congress. 
Now, the very first thing they do is they endorse the Suffolk Resolve, saying, yes, we agree with, we agree with our people in Boston that this is unacceptable, and as a body, the 13 colonies of America must resist Britain. What do we do? Well, the same thing we always do. We're going to boycott British goods. We will cut off all trade with Britain and the West Indies, the British um, colonies in the West Indies. Additionally, we will authorize committees of safety. Remember last class I talked about the Sons of Liberty, these sort of pseudo-vigilante revolutionaries that ran around enforcing the boycott on British goods, like keeping track that people were following the law? The committees of safety were the same thing. They would go around enforcing this end of trade with Britain. But remember what I said earlier. The moment you start calling on the common, everyday, regular working people to fight on your behalf for the principle of liberty, equality, and rights, they're going to start asking about their liberty, equality, and rights. And they're not just going to be upset with the British. They're going to look to the elders, the leaders of their community, saying, I don't have a vote, but you want me to fight to kill for you? We need to have a conversation, right? But that's chapter 6. Now, the next step is talking about um, independence. Are we ready? Are we not ready? There's talk of liberty and independence more and more and more. It's not everybody saying, I'm done, let's start killing the British. But it's more... I'm not sure how we can live in the British Empire anymore. There was a transformation that took place in the early, in, the, in, these, in the, uh, this period between 1763 and 1774, where Americans went from being proud members of the British Empire and loyal subjects of King George III to saying, I think we have less in common with the British than we originally thought. We have the language, the religion, and all that stuff. But we actually practice the political the political principles which we were taught. Representative government um, is a big one. Taxation without representation. We actually respect it, whereas the British seem to be circumventing our rights. So there's a difference there, and maybe independence may be the way to go. So what you start having now is a transformation from we are transplanted Englishmen living in the New World, and we have the right to the English Bill of Rights, which are unique to England and makes us the best humans in all of history and civilization. Now, Americans are talking about these aren't just English rights, which you get because you live under the British King and British Parliament, which at the time, the British King and British Parliament were taking away their rights. Now they started talking about more broad natural rights that are not given to you by government. You see, the English Bill of Rights is a, is a law. It's a, seri it's, it's, a, it's a document passed into law by Parliament in Britain, signed by the British King, right? Technically, rights given by a government, and thus technically rights that can be taken away, right? The funny thing is, though, the whole Bill of Rights was based on the thinking of John Locke, an Englishman who wrote a variety of letters and books at the time of the Glorious Revolution and the publishing of the English Bill of Rights, who made the argument about the people have a right to choose their government, and if the government is oppressive, the people have a right to overthrow their government. And John Locke was critical of the history of humankind because he was talking to people of sound, strong Christian faith who were told, your king is a servant of God who looks out for his people, his capital H, God's people. To disobey the king is to disobey the word of God. John Locke said, no. The counter argument for John Locke was natural rights. Rights that are not given by government and cannot be taken away by government. And his theory was pretty straightforward. If you go back to the beginning of time, before language, literature, customs, religions, anything, and you just had human beings, they had three basic rights. The right to their life, the, the right to their freedom, 
and the right to the property which they have either built or conquered with their own hands. Which they, those are the three things that they earned for themselves, they were born with. It wasn't given to them by anybody. So then the, kind of, then the next step is, well then how do we end up with government and laws? Humans came together to form societies, laws, government, to protect their life, liberty, and property. Well, if that's the case, if, govern if governments are formed with the consent of the people to protect their rights, then what do the people have the right to do if government fails to protect life, liberty, and property? What do they have the right to do? If people create government to protect their rights, and government becomes abusive, what do the people have a right to do? Overthrow them. And you're not disobeying God or anything. You are simply exercising your natural rights. Which is a pretty strong argument for people who are afraid they're going to go to hell if they disagree with the king. Plus, it's, conv it's also it's good for the Americans because natural rights got nothing to do with kings or parliament. It is the rights of human beings, government by the consent of the people. And you might say, yeah, the kings inherit their title from their fathers. They're not voting. Yes, but at some point, Locke would say, way back at the beginning, somebody got together, had a vote. Who wants to be our king? Okay, you win. Great. You get to pass on your throne to your son. That way we have political stability. And we all agree to that. Okay? So that was Locke's argument. It was a great argument because it legitimates people rising up in rebellion. And the Americans ate that stuff up, especially in 1774, 75, 76. Well, before we even declared our independence, we started killing British people. Because, you know, you got the Americans who already have British troops on their soil, shutting down their government, shutting down their economy in Boston. You already got that problem. So they start collecting weapons, because they're thinking war's going to break out at some point. The British find out that the Americans are collecting weapons secretly, preparing for open warfare. So they do what they're supposed to do. They hunt. They go hunting for this secret weapon stash to seize it. What happens? Well, the Americans find out, and the battles of Lexington and Concord, which are just outside the city of Boston, take place between American militia, volunteer soldiers, and British professional troops. That is the first bloodshed in the American Revolution, and we haven't even declared independence yet, in May of 1775. At this point, once the fighting started, colonists from the rest of the 13 colonies started flooding into Massachusetts, because that's where the fighting was. They showed up to volunteer for an American army that hadn't even been created yet. They just joined whoever was fighting on the American side which at this point was basically the militia of the, the, the colony of Massachusetts. In May of 1775, the same year, the Vermont and the Connecticut militia capture a British-held fort in upstate New York, Fort Ticonderoga, and take the cannon. And where do they take it? They take it to Boston. And they aim this cannon on the city of Boston where the British troops are holed up. Right now, if you look at a map of Boston, it looks like one big solid landmass. Back then, the city of Boston was a city at the end of a very skinny peninsula of land surrounded by hills. What the Americans did was they surrounded those hills with cannon aimed at the British troops stuck in the city of Boston, and the troops surrounded by these cannons said, okay, we're leaving, and they withdrew from Boston, and thus Boston fell into the Americans' hands as the second great victory of the American Revolution in March of 1776. <coughs> to this day, in the city of Boston, it is a holiday, evacuation day, celebrating when the British evacuated Boston and Boston became free then and forever. They still have a holiday. It's fantastic. My wife is from New England, so I know all this stuff. Now, the Second Continental Congress comes together in May 1775. They were already scheduled to meet, but in between their first and their second meeting, a lot of stuff happened. There was bloodshed between the soldiers of the British Army and the Americans. 
You had those victories at Fort Ticonderoga. You had the capture of Boston. Uh, the, event, the eventual capture. No. Yeah. Sorry. So they, the Bostonians leave in March 1776. So you had these initial victories. The Second Continental Congress comes together. And the very first decision is the fighting has started. We can keep talking about what we're going to do, but the fighting has already started. And we can't keep sending farmers out there with you know, spare guns to fight against the professional British Army. We need a Continental Army. So before we had a country, we had an army. So think about that for a moment. Um, it was called the Continental Army. And George Washington, the delegate from... George Washington, the uh, soldier from Virginia who fought in the wars against France during the, um, the uh, Seven Years' War, was unanimously chosen because he was a southerner, and most of the fighting had been taking place in the north. And for the Americans at this point, it was critical that if we were going to win this thing, if we were to declare independence, we couldn't do it with just Massachusetts, New York, and maybe Virginia. Everybody had to come in, send money, send troops, etc., because we're fighting the British Empire. So they did. The British respond by sending a ton of troops to the New World, and using the most powerful navy in the world, which is what they had, to encircle the 13 colonies and cut off all trade, essentially starving the Americans into submission. That was the goal. But there was no independence yet. Some colonies thought, what are we waiting for? Massachusetts is obvious, because they're the ones that are suffering the intolerable acts. Government shut down, the economy shut down, soldiers are living in people's homes, they were fighting at Lexington and Concord. Virginia is also into it. A big, wealthy, populous state, also concerned about their rights being taken away by British action. Pennsylvania and New York are a little uncomfortable with the notion of independence, because they're thinking... We already have trouble in Pennsylvania and New York with poor people, small farmers, landless workers who are challenging their local government's decisions because they're being encouraged by us challenging British authority. So we're having the poor challenging authority at home, and if we take the next step and declare independence, God only knows what's going to happen with our people back home. Like, how much resistance they're going to have to the basic laws that we have on the books. So they're not ready to vote on it yet at the Second Continental Congress. Then this guy comes along, Tom Paine. And I wish I had a photo of him. Tom Paine was the perfect person for the perfect time in America in history. Thomas Paine is known for a number of things, but the big thing is his book, Common Sense. If you were to download this book today from the internet, you'd be able to read it as if it was written by somebody nowadays. It's clear. It doesn't use any complicated phrases or words. It is written specifically for your average, everyday American to understand in their first read-through and to be able to communicate those ideas clearly to their friends and neighbors. And what is his big argument in his book, Common Sense? What is so common sense to Tom Paine? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Independence now. That's the beginning and end of it. Independence now. Okay, why, Tom? Because we are a democratic people. We elect our own governments. We always have. From our very beginnings, we elect our own people. But we are part of the British Empire that is ruled by a king that is not voted, and in partnership with British Parliament, which represents the British people, but most of the people that sit in British Parliament are not common people. They are the wealthiest of the wealthiest of the English nobility, who pass their wealth and their titles from father to son, no different than a king. But we didn't vote for them. These people could never understand democracy. 
And in fact, they've become corrupted. We need to be away from them. We can't. We cannot be a democratic people and live in the British Empire. The democracy has become, we, it was taught to us, but it's been corrupted by them. Moreover, we don't need to be a member of the British Empire. Why, Tom? Well, we are bigger. You don't need to be a member of the British Empire. The 13 colonies as a country is bigger in size than Britain. We are economically diverse. We could trade with the entire world if free of the British Empire, no longer restricted by them. So we will be economically self-sufficient. And if we are independent, Americans will never be dragged into a war initiated by the British Empire against the French or the Spanish or Native Americans or whatever. We'll be free to make our own decisions. These ideas spread like wildfire. People read his book. They read the excerpts of his book in newspapers. People talked about it in bars and public squares. And increasingly, people that had never given it a second thought were now saying, independence makes sense. We can't go back to what we were doing before, pretend like it's the same. Independence is the next logical step. He's right. So, we get this. The Declaration of Independence. It's 4th of July, 1776, with the Second Continental Congress, after weeks of excruciating debate, finally gets enough votes to pass this thing, and then it is read and distributed amongst the American troops, the American people, justifying independence. Let's all pull out that document. Let's all pull out the Declaration of Independence. Let's, let's talk about it for a bit. Let me read you the first paragraph. Um, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands, actually, has everyone got their document out? All right, we're on the very first paragraph. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. What does that paragraph mean to you? What does that say to you? What are they doing with that first paragraph? What are they saying? Yeah. Right, Mustafa? Yeah, they highlight the they're in order to justify no no what are they justifying by talking about rights their rights that are being violated yeah in great britain right they're making it very clear that this is a very serious act that they're taking they didn't come to it lightly so let's do this bit by bit I want to hear some folks read some stuff out to me. Who wants to start? We hold these truths. We'll start reading from there. Henry, start us off. We hold these truths. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Uh, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Okay, let's stop there for a moment, and then I'll go to Pedro. Do you have a hand up? Oh, oh. oh. all right. Um, did it, somebody have a hand up over there? Okay. All right, so first let's start off with that. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What does that mean to you when you read that? What does that mean to you? Just speak out loud. Go ahead. Z Sarah? Sarah? What they're saying is true, and it's, it's 
evidence like for themselves? Yes, yes. But what's another way of saying it's it's self evident? It's obvious. We are stating the obvious. So then you may ask yourself, if it's so obvious, then why do you need this many words to point out what's so obvious and everybody should already know? Right? Why would you spend this much time pointing out what they're saying is already understood? Go ahead, Johan. Well, <laughs> maybe common sense is not so common any, anymore. Maybe the British forgot what these self-evident rights were, which they taught to the Americans. And since the British forgot it, the Americans are reminding them and thus using that as their means to get out, right? Now, uh, men are created equal. There is no distinction there between black, white, rich, and poor, right? It's a very universal statement, right? Now, you know the writer of this document was Thomas Jefferson, right? Yeah? You know where Jefferson is from? Virginia. Slave state or non-slave state? Did Jefferson own slaves? Did Jefferson have children with, with his slave, one of his slaves, Sally Hemings? God almighty. Sally Hemings. So, talk to me about what it means to you when a slaveholder, Thomas Jefferson, writes that all men are created equal. That is a self-evident truth. What does that mean to you? I'm going to go around the room because you two, I feel like you already have some answers. Johan, don't give me like common sense is not so common, hot dogs are not so hot answer. <laughs> well, but if he was like, okay, so you think he is writing universally, but he really means white men of property. Okay. They all have their own idea of what freedom was. Like right. And just because he wrote it, you know, differently from how the British thought, doesn't mean that he was on the point with where he thought. Meaning, I don't disagree, I'm just looking for clarification, that's all. No, just, I mean, basically what he said that, um, and yet it's not there though there's no limitation there this is interesting 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 uh, other comments about that first line other comments Pedro? Okay. 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 So, he is writing, you're saying that at the time, when he wrote that all men are created equal, nobody in their right mind would ever have assumed yeah. that he was talking about anybody else than white men. Yeah. What about women? No. Not even women. Remember? Okay. No, I see where you're going with this. I see the transference of power. I get it. I see what you're talking about. All right. Is anybody troubled? Because other people that I've spoken to said, well, it's kind of hypocritical that a slave owner is writing that all men are created equal. But it seems that what I'm getting from you is, yeah, but he's not being hypocritical. He's obviously not referring to slaves or free blacks or women or Native Americans. How about poor people? Is he referring to poor people in this? Because democratic self-representation, you need to have property for the vote, right? Um, and I'm not disagreeing. Whatever you wrote down in your, your papers is fine. It's fine. 
But here's something I want you to bear in mind about Thomas Jefferson. Right? Um, there was a wide spectrum of slaveholders. Like there were slaveholders who were exactly the you know slaves or property end of the story. Then there were slaveholders who thought, you know, I inherited a plantation and slaves. I don't really like it, but I inherited it. I'm certainly not going to free them all, not while I'm alive. And some of them justified the tolerance of slavery by saying, you know what, it's going to die out naturally anyway. The tobacco plantations are going to become exhausted. Eventually, we're no longer going to need slave labor. It's going to die out anyway. And in fact, before the invention, the discovery of cotton and the mechanization of cotton, there was a broad belief that you know it's going to die out anyway. Why are we making a big stake about it? But after cotton became profitable and slavery like got locked in, then you couldn't ignore it any longer. So there's that. There's Jefferson's. Do you have a hand up? Okay, hang on. Um, there's Jefferson's belief that eventually slavery would end, right? But there's also this there's also this notion, and I don't know if you believe this because I'm not a Jefferson scholar, but I wonder if he was also thinking about if he was actually referring to all men, as in white men of property who have the right to vote, are created equal, right? White men of property are those people that he considers to be um, eligible and entitled to self-representation, right? And I don't know if he was thinking this, but what he did, though, was he sort of left open the door. That if white men of property are those that are currently eligible, capable of exercising the vote, is there a period in the future where maybe other peoples could reach a level of whatever, education, experience, where they would be eligible for voting. And as you read forward in the chapters, you'll see that Jefferson was nowhere near as locked in his views. Like, for instance, with Native Americans, he actually felt that, well, if you teach them Western culture, Western language, etc., they'll be no different than, than white men in terms of capacity. Unlike others, like President Andrew Jackson, who said, wipe them all out because, you know, they're on land that's ours. So, but be that as it may, we don't know what Jefferson was thinking. We don't know. But let me ask you this. Don't you think in a founding document for the independence of the country that if you were only really talking about white men of property, why wouldn't you have been more specific? Because aren't you sending a message? All men are created equal. Why would he do it on purpose, you think? Because maybe he left it open like that so that one day or like, you know, sometime in the future people could be like, but it says all men, that you know. Well, that might be deep in his heart. I want to see everybody equal in the future. But most immediately, what do you need to win a war? What do you need to win a war? You need so unity. So you're not going to say white men of property left-handed with a scratch <laughs> under the right. No, you're going to say all men. Right. And what? And this unity will allow you to put on the field what? Slaves. Soldiers, not slaves. Good God, <laughs> you wouldn't give guns to slaves. They would turn around and shoot the slave masters, right? Now, this is my point. And look at that line. Life. All that among these, the unalienable rights, unalienable means these are natural rights, not given by government and thus cannot be taken away by government. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness mimics John Locke's natural rights, life, liberty, and the enjoyment of property. Why did Jefferson purposely remove the word property for pursuit of happiness? And think about what you just told me. He's trying to appeal as broadly as possible to unify Americans in this cause. Why eliminate one of your rights is the enjoyment of your property and put in there one of your rights is the pursuit of happiness? Yeah? Well, I see it, I see it as a way that the, the poor, they won't act against their leaders. Like, you know, how you say, oh, they're going to help you, but you, you do the same, they're doing the same thing that the British, the British, British is doing to everybody else. But he's saying pursuit of happiness, happiness, 
giving Dom a chance, I think, you know, you're poor, but you can... Ah, uh, yes. You can become... That's exactly true. Not everybody has property. Mm -hmm. But everybody has a right to pursue happiness free of obstruction. And that happiness can be defined as wealth or, I don't know, yoga. Whatever you do. <laughs> right? You shouldn't live under unfair, oppressive laws. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Pedro, take me from the third line, sort of that to secure these rights. Yeah. We hold these truths. Keep going. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of any then it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles, and organizing its power in such form as to them shall be the most likely to affect their safety and happiness. All right. So what can we pull out from that uh, series of lines that Pedro just read? What stands out for you? Go ahead. They can alter and abolish um, the government if they're not content. Right. And, and governments get their authority from who? Mm -hmm. The people. The people consent. I agree to live by the rules that you create because I have given you that authority to protect my rights. But, that's the deal. If you don't hold up your end, I rescind my loyalty, my obedience. Now, um, let me see. Okay, this is a good one. Somebody pick up from prudence indeed will dictate. Who wants to pick up from there? Ashley, go ahead. Prudence indeed would dictate that governments long established should not be changed by might and trans transient, by like trans passing. Uh, Keep going. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Accustomed. Very good. What is that? series of words, sentence, mean to you? What does that mean to you? What are they communicating? Speak up, folks. Uh, you can't change the law for, like, anything. Right. And because that would lead to instability and chaos. And most people are prone to sucking it up instead of making fundamental changes in things like their system of government. Right? That's what he says there. Why do you think they're saying that? That most people will generally suffer the inconveniences and some actually nasty stuff instead of abolishing their government. That has been the history of humankind. Why do you think they point that out? That most people tend to not do what we're doing. Why do you think so? Go ahead, Emmy. So that after the freedom of the British, other people who are suffering... Okay, absolutely. They're making it clear that this is kind of a uni unique exception. We're not saying everybody has to break every law if you just don't like it. You know, this is a significant series of problems that we've been having, and independence is the only solution left, right? Why else do you think they're saying this? Because remember, this is a document being read out to the world, not just to Americans. Yeah? I think that everybody has their own opinion of what is right and wrong. So if they start um, saying, like, I don't like this, or I believe that this is right and it's not, like, going towards the good of the people, it's just not going to help. Okay. No, you're right. I think you're right. I think you're right. Let me, let me give you something else to think about. Declaring your independence from the British Empire is a big deal. And it's going to upset a lot of people. Americans who don't want to be independent, but also other empires that are afraid of their colonies declaring their independence. But the Americans need help. They know they can't fight the British on their own. And so they're making a very clear case that, you know, we're not just, you know, waking up on the wrong side of the bed. This is serious. We're in it for the long haul. All right? Now, let me see. Uh, 
So let me push forward. The very last line, the history of the present king of Great Britain is, wait, hang on a second. Zakaris, you've said nothing, and neither has Maybell. Why is that? All right, I'm going to go to you, and you're going to pick out some of the rights or some of the things that the colonists are upset about. And that's why they declared their independence. The last four lines, the history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injury, uh, injuries and usurpations taking away our rights all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states, the colonies. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. So, they're saying we're declaring independence, and here's why. And then they give you a rather long list of things that the British king and his parliament and people have done. So, Maybell, give me, pick, what, what did you write down in terms of one of the things that, uh, because that's what I asked, right? Uh, what are some of the things that the King of Britain did which forced the Americans to declare their independence? What did you pick out? Um, I wrote the cutting off of their trade with Africa. Uh, okay, so c kill, uh, taking away their inde independence, their economic rights. And remember, voting is based on property. If you interfere with the economy, you interfere with people's ability to vote and be free. Right? It's not just I don't make money anymore. I mean, you're taking away my democratic rights. What else, Mabel? Um, you can pick any one on that list. Okay. So Americans were no longer getting a fair trial by the jury of their peers. They're being sent away. Again, another violation of the basic principles of self-government. Um, Nikaris, what did you pick out as kind of, you know, whatever you wanted to highlight? What did you find? What did you write about? In the opinion, people are American laws. All right. The Americans voted for their own laws, and now the king is suspending their legislature and ignoring their laws. Anything else that you highlighted? The high tax of the United Nations. Okay. The taxation without representation. Very good. Uh, what other things that people come across and they write about? What else? Ashley? And okay. then Kelly. There was one thing said, I can't find it now, but um, when England kind of, I mean, he had this system of government, but it was kind of useless because he was bullying the people into agreeing with whatever he thought was right. Yes, yes, yes. I remember that as well. Uh, I don't know which ones, what number it is, but what else? Um, so, squatting, large fighting for foreign troops among us. Okay, and which is... Which uh, was the number that you said that no army was allowed if there was no war. Right. So they were sending there those, you know, exactly. those to tax them. Like, they were getting paid for it. They were paying for it with the taxes. Absolutely. And then when there was no war, like, just to make sure they get the money. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what else? Johan? Okay. Very good. Also important, when the Navy blocks all those ports trying to starve these people into submission. What else? No thinking of war, no more purpose of war. The king made one the old men of the and the king for war. Was there any particular point that sort of brought this forward to you mm -hmm. most uh, clearly? Yeah. All right, well, you look for it. I'll go shopping around the room in the meantime. <laughs> All right. Other people, any points that you'd like to highlight here that, you know, kind of spoke to you, that you wrote about? Okay. I kind of interlock, like, these with the acts. The intolerable acts? Or, or what? Yeah. So, did anybody else see any connections between this Declaration of Independence and all the things the Americans were upset with, with the intolerable acts, the Townsend duties, the Stamp Act? Anybody else see that? Well, it's there. 
I don't know if I've said this to you in this class, because I'm teaching a lot of classes this semester, and my mind has sort of left me already. But every document you will ever read in any history class is always a reflection of a problem, and that document is the solution. There is no reason to write down an English Bill of Rights unless people felt those rights were being infringed upon. There is no reason for a Declaration of Independence with a long list of abuses that the king per perpetrated without the fact that there was a long list of things that the king did that the Americans are saying they're upset about, and so on and so on and so on. Um, so let me highlight some things to you that I think are important. Um, There's one that I just want to draw to your attention. It's on the very, the last of the list of, you know, he has excited domestic insurrection among us. Everybody see where I'm at? It's the last of the long list. He has excited domestic insurrection among us and has ende endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. What they're referring to is the fact that the British allied with Native Americans who were upset that Americans were spreading westward and taking their land. But the very idea that white British soldiers and officers are allying with Native Americans, knowing full well that the warfare between Native Americans and, and whites has always been brutal is just a testament to how tyrannical and degenerate the British have become. And thus we need to declare our independence. But I also wanted to highlight for you how even in this document, which is sort of the highlight of the Enlightenment, all men are created equal, etc., etc., Indians are referred to as savages. There was a clear hierarchy here of civilized and uncivilized. Okay. Now, um, I'll, on what page is the word slavery? You sure? Are you positive? Forced labor, slavery. What page is that on? Anybody find anything like that? Well, if you did, it's because you wrote it in, because it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> and so you may ask yourself, I don't get it. How did the word slavery not appear in a document? Because the settlers were all slaveholders, and the interruption of trade with the outside world directly affected the slave-based economies, the plantations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? Well, it's actually just sort of dirty politics at this point. If you start putting the word slavery in a document that talks about the universal de uh, in, uh, freedom of all people, you're going to upset the people that have some problem with slavery. Southerners didn't want slavery put into this document because they didn't want to have the conversation. And Northerners didn't want slavery in the conversation because they didn't want to have the conversation. Because that is the one thing that fundamentally divides Northerners and Southerners. Not that the North was all anti-slavery. Not yet. But it was, it was a fundamental difference between the two sides. And if you bring in something that divisive, when the goal is to keep everybody wrapped up together, then you don't have a Declaration of Independence. You have a Declaration of what we don't agree on. <laughs> so, let me just push forward for the, uh, the benefit of, and I, I guess I'll take up some of this next class. The war is declared after independence. It goes very badly for the British, excuse me, for the Americans, mostly because the British have got a large, well-financed professional army that has fought against other professional armies. And the Americans don't really have a professional army. They have a few really good officers, but a bunch of really excited farmers. <laughs> That's it. The British also had the world's best navy. 
they can bring in supplies from all over the world. They got endless reinforcements they can bring in. So what have the Americans got going for them? Well, the fact is, they're fighting at home. The British are bringing in folks 3,000 miles away, A. B, the Americans know the land. They, they're fighting in the valleys, mountains, hills, woods that they grew up in, right? And C, the Americans got no choice. You either win or you'll get hanged. So you got, you know, if the British lose, well, okay, we lost the American colonies, but we have this entire British empire. The Americans lose, they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Desiree. Is it also that the British were pretty much still kind of that former Seven Year War? For the American advantage? Yeah, the Americans also knew. They looked at the numbers. You know, it's going to be hard for us to fight this war. Thank you. But the British, are, it's going to be really expensive for them. And they're still recovering from the last big war. All we got to do is just hold out. Essentially, you know how the Vietnamese will beat the Americans in the Vietnam War? They just didn't give up. And eventually the Americans got tired of dying and spending all that money, and they went home. That's how the Vietnamese won. They were comfortable taking unbelievable casualties. And the Americans finally said, okay, we're not going to win this thing until we nuke Vietnam, but we're not going to do that. So we'll just end the war. The Americans at this time knew, as long as you keep a, an army in the field, then independence is alive. And the British got to keep sending more troops, more troops, and eventually they're going to win or just get tired. What about black soldiers? Well, on the American side, George Washington says you fight for us, eventually you get your freedom. The British, they were pretty good about it. They said, just come on over right now and help us out against the Americans. You get your freedom right away, and a whole lot abandoned their plantations, and why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? What's that? Well, once the British landed, excuse me, once the British took the fight to the south, the closer they got to the plantation, they just put up, you know, the call saying, hey, come on across our lines. You have freedom immediately. Fight on our side. And I'm not going to go through, like, every battle and everything, but just for your purposes for when you read through the textbook and you look through these maps, i got two minutes and I'm not going to keep you here later. A lot of the fighting was focused in this area, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, but the most brutal fighting really was down here in the south, where the British Army was fighting all across this territory. Remember that, that movie, um, The Patriot, with Mel Gibson from about ten years ago? That all took place in the south. All that guerrilla fighting and the militias working with the continent, that was all in the south. Um, a lot of the fighting in the north was over early. Boston was captured by the Americans, but the British captured New York and Philadelphia. Um, the open fighting down here was the stuff that lasted through the late 1770s, early 1780s. But the one thing that I want to bring to your attention is this. In October 1777, British troops are defeated at Saratoga in, unless I'm totally exhausted, upstate New York. Um, in Saratoga, once the British, yeah, upstate New York, once they, the British Army is defeated, after a whole series of British victories before that, a critical thing happened in the American Revolutionary War. The French and the Spanish decide to come in on our side. The Spanish and the French send in money, the French send in their troops, and most importantly, they let us borrow their navy. Or, you know, their officers, but... Their navy was now on our side against the British navy. Now, why do you think the French and the Spanish wanted to help us out? Which is? The British. Yeah. The Seven Years' War, the British not only beat the French Empire, they also beat the Spanish Empire. Desiree? Ah, then they could be open traders with the British and the French, uh, uh, the Spanish and the French. Very good. Very good. So, um, let me just cut forward to the chase. I want to bring you towards what happens. There's a series of victories in the early 1780s where the Americans finally figure out what they're doing. The soldiers that haven't gone home and given up, they've stayed in the field, they've gone from being voluntary soldiers 
to being hardened veterans. The officers learned their thing, so now American troops can actually fight the British troops in open battle and hold their own. And the British are getting tired. And they're slowly kicked out of South Carolina, kicked out of North Carolina, and they're pushed back, they're pushed back, they're pushed back. And they're finally pushed into Yorktown, Virginia. Yorktown, which is at the end of a narrow spit of land. They're forced to retreat into Yorktown in a fort, which is fine, because the assumption was we could always be evacuated by the British Navy, even if we're surrounded, because the fort is at the end of a narrow spit of land. If we're surrounded because the American troops have got us hemmed in by land, we've always got the British Navy to evacuate us, and we'll take the fight elsewhere, except for the fact that it was the French Navy in the harbor waiting for them, at which point General Cornwallis had to give up his entire army. And when word got back to London that General Cornwallis has surrendered thousands of troops to the Americans, to a people in England, Britain, etc., excuse me, that were already thinking, how much more money are we putting into this war? They're not giving up. If we were going to win this thing, it was going to be in the first couple of months. We're years into this. Now we're fighting against the French and the Spanish. And we're even losing open field battles. They now have a professional army against us. And now they've actually caught an entire British army. I think it's time to accept the inevitable. And in 1781, even though peace hasn't been declared... The American Revolutionary War is over. The British just give up, and they start negotiating the peace, which is not here. Uh, the next page, the Treaty of Paris. And I'll talk about that at the beginning of next class. So thank you very much for your patience. Sorry for being late. Um, please hand in your work on your way out. And enjoy your weekend. And we're not seeing each other for a little while, correct? We are not seeing each other next Tuesday or Thursday. We see each other Tuesday, September 30th, at which point I have Kelly, Ashley, Nayleth, and Denise up as volunteers. No, you get, it's like exponential goodness is what it is. Yes, ma'am. No, December 30th? All right. Just make sure you get me the work ahead of time, okay? I guess email it to me at this point. And remind me, we, you know, where we talk, blah, 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 blah. All right. Johan, are you still here? Okay. Henry, last class. Ibrahim, let me write your name properly on the roster.